I'm James Robinson. This is Multiverses. The shape of our world affects the shape of our lives. The fact that we live in three stretched out spatial dimensions has surprising implications. It underpins, for example, a set of laws which determine not only how heart rate varies from species to species, but how the pace of life increases in cities as they grow in population. Our guest this week is Geoffrey West, a theoretical physicist. He started studying out particles and ended up leading a group at Los Alamos, but he became interested in problems from biology. In particular, the problem of lifespan, why some species live longer than others. And as he set about studying biology, he came across a century-old conundrum, Kleiber's law. Now, Kleiber's law describes how the metabolic rate of species changes with their mass, depends on their mass. So, for example, a species that weighs twice as much as another one doesn't require twice as much food. It only requires 75% more. So there's an economy of scale here. And this relationship is incredibly regular. It's an example of a scaling law. And to cut a long story short, Jeffrey solved this conundrum, and he solved the conundrum of lifespan too. And the kernel of the solution is this. Organisms are networks. They're networks of cells connected by a vascular system. And these networks don't scale in the same way as the mass. They, they have a peculiar scaling because of their fractal nature, or fractal nature, sorry. Jeffrey got interested in what other systems um, that are networks uh, and, and how they scale. Do we also see interesting behaviour for companies and cities, for example? Indeed, we do. So if you take a city and you double it in size, its energy usage doesn't double. It only goes up by 85%. So there's a similar economy of scale here. But the productivity of that city, which you can measure, for example, by the number of patents per head or the, the number of restaurants, the productivity doesn't double as you double its population. It goes up by 115%. It more than doubles. And this makes cities these huge engines of growth because as, city grow, as cities grow, they become yet more productive and yet more attractive to people. So they grow even more. And this leads, in fact, to super exponential scaling, faster than exponential scaling in, in, in the production that comes from cities. And that is not sustainable. Uh, so I don't know what the answer is there, but that's a serious problem. This is a marvellous conversation f from for me. Um, Jeffrey is as wonderful a storyteller as he is a brilliant scientist. I thoroughly recommend his book, Scale, but without further ado, this is Jeffrey West. Uh, Jeffrey West, thank you for joining me. Yes, pleasure, James. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. You started your career looking at the tiniest of things, at quarks and so forth, and, and, and very far away project uh, problems like the, the origin of the universe. But you've ended up in a very different place, looking at enormously large systems composed of lots of little things and speaking to the issues that concern us every day. Um, can you tell us how you went about, how, how did that journey happen? Oh boy, let's see if I could keep it <laughs> brief. <laughs> um, well, first of all, of course, um, I, I don't suppose any of it would have happened had I not had a sort of natural predilection to wanting to sort of, I mean, that sounds, <laughs> sounds arrogant almost, understand everything. You know, as a boy, you know, I was always asking questions. I was interested in everything as one does when is, you know, in, in, uh, as a young boy and in, even in high school and so forth. Um, and I, I always harbored a sort of romantic image of what being an academic would be. And, I, and that was sort of enhanced by being an undergraduate at Cambridge, just the, the, the physicality of it. I mean, mm. <laughs> and uh, sort of romant totally romantic and unrealistic image. <clears throat> and, and, and I sort of had this image that I'd always be around people asking questions across the entire spectrum of life, so to speak. Um, but I was also very good at mathematics. And uh, but what I think happened was that um, that led me naturally to physics because physics seemed to be the only science that actually answered questions. <laughs> it was the, you know, they pose them, the, these deep questions, and they answer them. But they not only answered, they answered them in a 
rather precise quantitative fashion with an analytic deductive strategy. And that yeah. was very appealing. So I ended up doing, as you say, high energy physics of quarks and gluons and string theory and dark matter and all these wonderful questions. But then, um, but I always sort of was slightly frustrated um, that uh, I, I was being forced into this box, even though I had a, a rather, um, you know, a very eclectic group around me. Uh, nevertheless, um, uh, so that kept going. And then um, in the, I guess it must have been the um, late 80s, 90s, when this uh, superconducting supercollider was being uh, proposed and being built. You know, you know this huge accelerator right. um, that uh, was going to cost uh, the beginning of the order of $10 billion. And uh, uh, we were all very excited about it and so on. And then it was canned in the early so 90s. This, this uh, is a big facility in the, in the, that in was going to happen in the USA, right? Yes, um, in Texas. It was much bigger than the Large Hadron Collider, now at CERN, it was, you know, um, and uh, it got canned. Uh, and uh, so it was kind of a, obviously a crisis in the field. And I, like many others, uh, were, went into a kind of depressed mode. But I also went into a mode of, you know, oh, oh so part of it was, it also coincided that, um, cancellation of the superconducting supercollider, the SSC, um, coincided with one of those waves of um, anti-science that uh, mm. comes to fore every once in a while. And it, it, it focused primarily on physics. And the comment that was always around was, physics was the science of the 19th and 20th century centuries. The science of the 21st century will be biology. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, it's hard to argue with that in many ways, but it was, but I reacted, you know, saying, yes, that's very likely, but biology will not be a real science <laughs> until it somehow integrates um, and absorbs the culture and some of the techniques of physics. It doesn't have to have physicists necessary, but it needs to think more like physics. Now, mm -hmm. by the way, this was total arrogance and total ignorance because I knew no biology and it was coming out of pure defensiveness and reaction to this SSC thing. Um, uh, but, you know, we heard that all the time, but there was also a corollary to that that was either left unsaid, but sometimes said, um, uh, and that was, there's no need to do any more fundamental physics. We know all the fundamental physics we need to know. Let's devote our resources to other things. And I felt that was completely um, mistaken. Um, so uh, sitting around one day, I thought, you know, that, that I keep saying this statement that biology won't become a real science that does physics. You know, it's sort of stupid, but maybe I should try to put money where my mouth is and try to think of doing some biology on my own. Well, that happened to coincide also with some concerns obviously initiated to some extent by the, the collapse of the SSC that I was getting old. I was in my mid fifties at the time. Um, and uh, I come from a very short lived line of males. Most of us die in our fifties and sixties. And so I realized that, you know, if, if genetics play a role, I probably don't have more than about 10 more years. And, and I started thinking about it. I thought, why is that? You know, what is it that's, that, that is the origin of aging? And um, I thought that's an interesting problem to think about, but no doubt there must be you know, tons of work been done in biology on this and in medicine. Um, and um, so I st but I started thinking about it. And then I started thinking a little more seriously by going to the library and actually reading about it. And one of the things I discovered was that in fact, it was a total backwater hmm. that despite the fact that at least, at least the way I think about it, it's the second most, death is the second most important event in the life of an organism, birth being the most important, but death is, you know, that's it. And yet here you found, you know, here it was a backwater. I looked in these big fat books 
um, you know, that they teach uh, elementary biology in that covers all of biology, and you look in the index, nothing about aging and death. No. Everything else is covered. So I thought, ooh, that's good, because that means that uh, maybe this is something I can think about. But then another thing I realized was that I had set myself not just the question, why do we age and why do we die? But why do we live 100 years? So I'd put it in a physicist terms, simplistically. Where in the hell does the scale of life come from? You know, why 100 years? Uh, why not 1,000 years? You know, what are the knobs that you can turn to make us live 1,000 years? Or what knobs have been turned by natural selection? And so on. So um, I started thinking about that. And um, the, the first thought that I had to start, you know, actually deriving, quote, a theory <laughs> was, look, if the system is going to age, decay, and eventually disappear, um, obviously, you have to understand what it was in the first place that was keeping it alive, you know, because obviously something has gone wrong. I mean, it's produced too much entropy or whatever. So, uh, and that's called metabolism in biology. So I didn't know much about that. So I started reading about metabolism and I learned about these extraordinary scaling laws in biology. That is that, um, and maybe we will hopefully talk a little bit about that later on, but I discovered, I discovered, I learned reading that there was this famous law discovered in the 1930s by a man named Max Kleiber that said that metabolic rate, the most from a physicist's viewpoint, certainly, but maybe also a biologist, the most fundamental quantity of life, how mm. much energy does the organism need to stay alive? How much food does it need to eat per day to stay mm -hmm. alive? If you asked how did that scale with the size of an organism, that scaled in an extraordinarily simple mathematical way. There's a so-called power law. Um, uh, and, and the way that's represented is if you plot the metabolic rate logarithmically, that is going up by factors of 10 um, on the vertical axis against weight plotted logarithmically on the horizontal axis, all the points fitted on a straight line. Mm -hmm. And that blew my mind because I was a great subscriber, as we most of us are, to the idea of evolution by natural selection and this kind of naive idea that it's all historically contingent. Everything depends on what's happened before and the frozen accidents that have happened and the kind of environmental niches thing organisms involved in, not just the organism, but every component of the organism. Therefore, you would have expected if you plotted anything as complex as metabolic rate versus size, there would be, you know, there might be some correlation, but the points would be all over the graph reflecting historical contingency. This was quite the contrary. And I thought, my God, you know, there must be an explanation for this. Well, it turned out that there wasn't a satisfactory one. There was no unit. And by the way, this was true across all of life. It wasn't just sort of mammals and birds or fish, but everything mm -hmm. followed this straight line. Not only that, the slope of this straight line, Max Kleiber had learned, was three quarters, very close to three quarters. So I thought, and, and so I first thought, that's great. Um, I'll use this to learn about aging. But I first better understand where this law comes from myself. Uh, and so I started biology. And <laughs> I, <laughs> I learned, I derived that law from some fundamental principles. Um, I hooked up with some extremely good biologists and we eventually published a paper in science that got a lot of publicity. And, uh, you know, I was still running a big high energy group, by the way. I mean, it yeah. was sort of weird. It was sort of a hobby still. But it became very clear that this was much more exciting <clears throat> than the epsilon progress I was making in string theory that anyway, no one was paying much attention to anyway. Whereas here I was getting accolades for doing this, this work in biology. So that serendipitously led to my sort of adiabatically, slowly moving into becoming a kind of pseudo biologist. Yeah, I think, and in a moment, we'll, I, I want to 
go into the details of where that three three quarters scaling law yes, comes yes, from yes. And, and what it means because that's that's so fascinating but i do want to pause here because it's such an extraordinary story this arc going from you know being quite a <clears throat> eminent theoretical physicist running a group at los alamos in one field and then you know fairly late for most people in their career at least yes. you, you you take a completely different track in some ways it will find out that you actually use the tools of a yes, theoretical sure. physicist but you know it's an extraordinary it's it's an incredibly ambitious program to say oh no one's no one's figured out why animals why 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 humans live for a hundred years there's nothing in the literature on this i'm quite intrigued about that problem so i'll I'll go and I'll go and find the solution, um, and you know what one wouldn't expect a lot of progress. Uh, you know that doesn't sound like it's going to be a fruitful start of a research program, but it it really was. Um, I, I just love these kind of two act books, you know, and uh, this seems like one of them. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so of course. Uh, by the way, just to repeat what I said earlier, it was a um, a, a product of arrogance, ignorance, and naivete. Um, and and it's true, I did not expect that this would have, you know, that I'd be able to solve the problem, frankly. And I didn't expect that, you know, that this would lead to a change in direction of my career. But I was very open to it. That's why I told the SSC. I was very open to it because it was uh, for two reasons. One was because the field I was in was going through a crisis mm -hmm. and stagnation. And also... I realized that some at some semi-conscious level, I had felt constrained or claustrophobic somehow. Surprising in a way when you think about it, because I was working in string theory, which I think mm. maybe not by then, maybe it had, it had already been dubbed this ridiculous term, theory of everything. Um, and and here I was feeling claustrophobic right. about the kind of theory of everything to work. And, and one of the things I realized later, by the way, was um, I had also part of that arrogance was that um, part of the culture of physics, but particularly high energy physics and theoretical high energy physics, um, was and is still to some degree that all you need to know is the fundamental equations. You know, if you knew, you know, if string theory is it, and it is beautiful, by the way, I'm not putting any of that down, quite the contrary. Um, if it is it, um, um, that all you got to do, you have the theory, you have the equation, and then you solve it, and you keep turning the crank, and out come, you know, uh, the origins of the universe, and the Big Bang, and then come galaxies, and then planets, and then you have the Earth, and then there's life, and then there's, you know, automobiles, and then there's iPhones, and it all comes from, you know, just turning the crank. And there, oh, because once you have that equation, in a certain sense, it's all engineering. So that was sort of, I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating and making a total cartoon version, but that was sort of the mindset. And the, the, the thing that I learned of, was the obvious that the, the equally challenging and even more exciting in some ways is the messy stuff that exists on this planet. As far as we know, this is the only place in the universe, as far as we know, some probably are other places, this is it. This, this complete mess that we live mm. in on this planet and all these extraordinary processes that take place um, called life or complex systems um, are even more challenging, remarkably, than understanding the origins of the universe, which mm. is weird. You know, we, yeah. can, we think because physics has built into it, the culture is that there is an equation, a fundamental equation, and from that follows everything. Well, one thing will follow is the evolution of the universe, and we've done an incredible job. I mean, the, the progress in, in cosmology, um, astrophysics, astrobiology even, has been fantastic in the last 25, 30 years. Um, but it's, it's all, you know, what, what 
<laughs> some of us call simplicity. That's not a, you know, that because you can write an equation and try and solve it and continue. I mean, it's a linear, almost linear process. Whereas trying to understand what's going inside your head at the moment, you know, we're probably never under, I mean, that's not, yeah. <laughs> that's not a yeah, personal yeah. statement. But, you know, understanding our brains and consciousness and, you know, what the stock market is going to do and, uh, you know, are we going to solve all the problems of the future of the planet? Those are a completely different category of problems. That's you right. can't write that's... an equation. Yeah. I, I think we're not saying in, that in principle there's some kind of new non-physical behavior that emerges, right? In, in principle, if you could crank that equation, it would produce, or it does indeed, if, if we had the equation, a theory of everything, that is, you know, the underlying dynamics that governs everything. And in principle, it could be cranked perhaps, but it, you know, in practice, it can't. And even if it could, I'm not sure that that cranking would produce understanding. It might right. produce, you know, the right outcomes, but would it actually explain anything to you in a, in a human sense? Pr probably not. Um, yes, I mean, we don't learn anything about life from the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the nuclei of, of atoms of, are made of protons and neutrons, or well, we do from that, but the protons and neutrons are made of quarks and gluons and so on. It doesn't, uh, you know, so there is this, which physicists recognize, there's this level structure, and those levels um, are to varying degrees um, uncoupled. In some cases, they're highly coupled. And the trouble in, for life on Earth, for the stuff on Earth, all the various levels are very closely coupled and they're all interrelated. And you can't do that separation. And that's what makes, that's what allows us to do physics in a way, is that, uh, especially fundamental physics, because levels tend to get separated from each other and you can consider them um, autonomously. Yeah, yeah. Let's come back to these remarkable scaling laws, which we should say Max Kleiber discovered almost a hundred years ago, I think, um, in, oh, exactly. um, yes. in the 1930s. So it, it was, you know, it's incredible that they they were sort of laid to one side for for so long. Um, and you know what they say is truly remarkable that if you double the mass of a of an organism, uh, so if you go from one animal that weighs half of a, half of another species that heavier species doesn't need twice as much food per day it needs about 75 percent more so that's the the three quarters of the of the um exponent that you mentioned um and this is this three quarters is remarkably consistent across species um and across kingdoms it's not just animals it's plants as well that that same exponent turns up if you're looking at uh, like the number of leaves in in trees it doesn't double as you um, double the mass of the tree it again only goes up by three quarters that's an incredibly striking thing how does one go from seeing that relationship in the data to then figuring out an explanation for that yeah. So first of all, I want to just um, uh, continue with the phenomenology of it. That is, it's yeah. not just metabolic rate, where you already said it, number of leaves. It's almost anything you can make. What is extraordinary, and the thing that really got me, wasn't, I mean, the metabolic rate got me. But then when I learned very quickly that uh, almost any physiological quantity trait of any kind of organism obey similar laws, as does any life history event. So a physiological trait would be like number of leaves or the length of your aorta and so on. And life history would be, you know, how long you live, in fact, um, uh, or how many offspring you have or how long do you take to mature, you know, all these kinds of, they all scare you about them. <laughs> they all have these straight lines. And the, the thing that is so striking is that the uh, slopes of those lines always simple multiples of one quarter. Yeah. So there's this extraordinary universality and first discovered uh, by Kleiber. But um, the, the, during the uh, 30s, 40s, and into the 50s even, um, people just added to this so that there's, you know, 
huge amounts of data that can be collapsed onto these scaling curves. And one of the things that helped me in my work was it just so happened that in the late 80, in the early 80s, two or three books had been written summarizing all of this data, basically. And so it was already there, ready to be explained, if you like. I mean, so, um, uh, but there was interest in these laws. They weren't sort of put aside then quite. And in fact, you know, many of the most distinguished biologists, Huxley, Hordain, uh, and so forth, um, Darcy Thompson, all were intrigued by these things. Um, but what killed it, of course, was the uh, molecular revolution. I mean, the, uh, the realization that uh, we can really understand very important, powerful aspects of life from a molecular viewpoint and uh, with the discovery of the structure of DNA, <clears throat> et cetera. And that completely dominated biology and to, and to varying degrees still does. I mean, that viewpoint, much like high energy physics has the viewpoint that everything can be, you know, if you know the fundamental laws of quarks and gluons, you get everything. There's sort of this naive view in biology. If I, oh, well, I, I mean, in fact, it was in the Human Genome Project, it was basically said, once I've mapped the human genome, everything follows, you know, we know everything, which was, you know, even I, who knew very little about it, thought that was absurd. Um, but anyway, that's, that's beside the point. Uh, so here were these, so they went into sort of uh, onto a back burner, um, known mostly only to ecologists, because for obvious reasons, in, in an ecology, you need to know when you're talking about interaction of species, um, um, how their metabolic rates change with their size and so on. So many ecologists knew it. And my, my major collaborator, Jim Brown, was a very distinguished ecologist. And he, we came together because he was very uh, intrigued as to what the hell the origin of these laws were that he was using. You know, where in the hell do they come from? Um, so now let me try to answer your question. Um, indeed, where do they come from? So the thing that got me uh, immediately when I realized that, um, uh, th th that these laws were ubiquitous and had this universality to them, was that obviously whatever the underlying principles were had to transcend the uh, sort of in evolved engineered design of life. That is, you just you know, if it applies to trees and to mammals, it has to be something that is independent of uh, the, the you know what makes you a mammal and what makes a tree a tree, and um, so one of the things that is common, of course, and that's why the molecular revolution was so powerful, was, of course, genes. Um, and, and you could say, well, it's encoded in the genes. That doesn't explain anything, of course. That just sort of puts it back one step. Um, uh, and so I sort of dismissed that. I didn't, that was not a very satisfactory answer. And then I thought, well, there is one thing <clears throat> that is common to all of these. Um, first of all, it's obvious that a lot of these are to do with the use of energy in some form or another, uh, metabolism being the most obvious example, but um, you have to distribute energy. And maybe all these laws are simply a reflection of the mathematical and physical constraints on the networks that had to evolve in order to distribute energy. So natural selection, as it evolved, multi, especially multicellular organisms, but even, you know, unicellular ones with huge numbers of components, it had to evolve networks that distributed energy and information to all the various components in a roughly, let's say, democratic, efficient way. You know, just thinking in a very coarse-grained way of thinking about it. <clears throat> So I thought, well, maybe that's the origin of it. Um, let me try and see if it works for mammals. Just that idea, take that idea for mammals. So um, I started to look at the structure of networks and I wrote down the mathematics of these networks and wrote down some generic universal principles that I thought might apply to them. Like, for example, one is obvious. 
One is that um, the network, say your circulatory system, its terminal units, it's empty by the capillaries, have to end up feeding all the cells. So the network has to be what's mathematically called space filling. It has to go everywhere. I mean, has, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> but you have to put that into mathematics. <clears throat> the, the, uh, the second most important one was that um, if you look at all mammals, that um, natural selection, when it evolved different species uh, uh, that are, that are mammalian, um, did not reinvent all the fundamental components. You don't start, you know, from the beginning again. It, um, it used the same fundamental units, same, basically the same cells, the same capillaries, and so on. So the idea was that this network ends at a capillary and then feeds a cell. But the capillary is the same in the mouse as it is in the whale. That is... And, in, and the idea being also that, look, um, if you, um, in your house, the end of a terminal unit is, your, is an electrical outlet plug in the wall. Now, you live in a, I don't know why, well, <laughs> let's say you live in a modest-sized building, but I don't know in Edinburgh, but in London and certainly in New York, there are skyscrapers. When they scale up to a skyscraper from your house, they don't scale up the electrical outlets. The outlets stay the same. And so it is, you know, all the outlets, the, the faucets, the taps on your, um, on, in your sinks and so forth, all these outlets. So I said, okay, that's almost certainly true of the sorts of systems that have evolved biologically. So that's another one. But the last one, the last sort of speculative principle was that, and this is the most important one, was that um, of all the possible networks that could have evolved, uh, that are, even if they're space filling and have these invariant terminal units, the ones that actually have evolved by the process of natural selection, and this is where natural selection really comes in, are the, are, um, the ones that have minimized the amount of energy that is needed in order to keep sustain the system. Namely, the idea being, so let's take the circulatory system again, that we all have a circulatory system that has evolved to minimize the amount of energy our hearts have to do to pump blood through it to supply the cells to keep you alive, um, so that you can maximize the amount of energy you can devote to sex, and reproduction and the rearing of offspring. So that was my, in the end, our translation of Darwinian fitness, that is more <laughs> putting, pushing your genes forward, so to speak. Um, that was the translation of that into a physical framework. It's, it comes very naturally from a physics-y way of thinking, I guess, as yeah, well. Like really, you've got to minimize right, some quantity. And you know something, I, 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 I did that and I just sort of did, you know, we did it and so on. And it was only much later, I realized, shit, you know, that's really, I mean, I hate to say this sounds, uh, that's quite profound, actually. You know, that, that, the, that natural, select, the, the survival of the fittest, so to speak, the continuous feedback, positive feedback in competition in the environment has led to those that can maximize their Darwinian fitness by minimizing the amount of energy they need to devote to keeping themselves alive, that mundane part. So it's a whole different, it's a sort of a different view of, or a different rephrasing of natural selection. Mm -hmm. and, and it's sort of interesting because it's only in the last couple of years I thought, it's so weird, we never emphasize that in our work. I mean, we talk, we say it, but it deserves. I've often thought I, it deserves a little essay or something that sometimes I should write trying to promote that as a just, you know, a different way of thinking about it. It's, and as from my viewpoint, it's equivalent. It's not a, it's a, anyway. Mm -hmm. But the point about that is that physics operates by optimization. All the fundamental laws of physics 
are derived from optimization principles, everything from general relativity to Newton's laws. And so, you know, we're, that's the way many of us like to think about systems is what is being optimized. And then we have the apparatus. I mean, much of the apparatus of mathematical physics is related to optimization problems and, um, and constraints. Yeah. Newton's so, bead on a wire was sort of... Yeah, that's right. Exactly. exactly. That was the beginning of calculus, um, differential. Uh, so. Exactly. So it was very much in that spirit. And so um, I started working out on that, work, working on that, at first on my, totally on my own. And I made what I thought was progress. <laughs> uh, well, it was progress. I thought I'd derive. It wasn't. And, but I then was hooked up with Jim Brown, a uh, biologist who had been thinking about this as a biologist, as an ecologist. And uh, he and his student, a man named Brian Enquist, who is now himself a, a, a highly established, well-known ecologist, uh, we started meeting as a discussing it. And I was telling him what I had done. And they were telling me what I'd done wrong or what was not right biologically and getting it straight. And it took a year for what I had thought I'd derived. And it was basically, I mean, 90% was, well, maybe 80% was basically right um, to uh, um, getting it in, in, uh, in shape to write a, a paper that then was published eventually in science. Um, but it took a year. And by the way, it was a real year. I mean, we, we made a commitment at the beginning. It was kind of an interesting, um, uh, something I'd never done. Um, we met, we were at two different institutions and uh, it turned out for various reasons, it was very convenient to meet in the middle at the Santa Fe Institute. And that, that began my association with the Santa Fe Institute. But we made a commitment that we would meet every Friday morning beginning about between nine and 10, and they would hang around till about two or three. And we would just stay together with a blackboard and bat battle things out. And, you know, I knew no biology and they were, how shall I say, um, challenged, mathematically challenged. <laughs> uh, you know, so it took, it took a bit. It was, it was sort of like, often liken it to a marriage, you know, where you get, it's beautiful and wonderful. And then other times you think, Jesus Christ, what am I doing with this? They're driving me nuts. They don't understand that, you know, this and that. And I'm sure yeah. they felt exactly the same, but it was a wonderful, it was a tremendous uh, collaboration, which lasted for about 15 years, actually. But that, to... and then when, having got that paper, by the way, the important thing was having done that work, it opened up everything because metabolism underlies so many things. And so the network theory underlies so many things. You could just sort of, sort of apply the same kinds of ideas to, you know, a whole plethora of subjects across biology. First, I just want to say, I, I think... I feel like a, a year doesn't seem that long, given that you're just spending your, your Friday mornings on it. So it's a reminder well, how much one can accomplish if, you, if, if the time is set aside and the right collaborators are, are found. That's a good point. You know, I, I, that's a good point because, I mean, the, the thing was Jim was running a big ecology group. I mean, a, doing work in the field. Um, and I was running, still running high energy physics up at Los Alamos. So, uh, you know, both of us were working in our spare time kind of thing on it. But it was became very clear, maybe it was more than, it was probably a year and a half as I think about it. But anyway, uh, it became very clear to all of us that this was one of the most exciting things, not only we were doing then, but we had, we'd never been doing. I mean, despite all my love of high energy physics and all the work that I was quite proud of, um, this, this was really exciting. I mean, first of all, to go from a totally abstract world of quarks and strings to a world where, you know, you, <laughs> real thing, <laughs> you know, uh, vascular systems and uh, metabolic rates and, and growth rates and uh, cancer and so on was... Um, it was very exciting. 
Yeah, it's not it's not easy to crank through from the you know string theory to figure out why a whale lives so much longer than a mouse, <laughs> right? Um, and I want to let's 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 go a little bit more into the details on on this um, three quarter power. So so we said that nature is or evolution is trying to optimize for something, and it's it, you know it's keeping the energy cost down. So I guess. What the networks are trying to do is deliver stuff to the cells, the terminal units, as efficiently as possible. Um, and it, in my mind, at, at least, it seems like what what they need is as large a surface to do that as possible. It's sort of like if you're trying to push a lot of water through a, a liter of water through a straw, you're going to have to work pretty hard. But if you want to push it through a big fat pipe, it's it's very easy. Um, is that sort of the bones of what needs to be maximized, as it were, kind of the surface area that, that you're touching all the cells with? Well, you can't put it that way. Um, and indeed, that's one way you can look at it. Because um, let me just back off a second to the network, and I will come back to that. Because mm-hmm. you've got it exactly it's right. I mean, what you said is correct. But I want to put it in a slightly different form. Um, so... Uh, you know, when you grind through the mathematics of, uh, so you have to do the mathematics of a network, as you say, a heartbeat. So the complication here, which is not true for trees, that's the trees and plants, is you have a beating heart. You know, you don't have a pump that's just pushing like like a straw, you know, it's a suck. You're going, you're, you're beating heart. So it's pulsatile. Um, so uh, that complicated things, um, but um, so uh, but you nevertheless it's the same idea that you're pushing blood uh, through the network down to the cells, and um, when you do the mathematics of that, what you discover is that um, where that three quarters comes from is that the three is it actually it's not three quarters. What the result is is. Three divided by three plus one, which is of course three quarters. <laughs> but the three in that, in those, is the dimension of space you're in. So, um, if you were in five dimensions, it would be in five over five plus one. Okay. So, um, and that's natural that that three would occur somewhere. Um, the dimension of space you have to fill, you have to supply. Um, the plus one is subtle but is to do with your statement about maximizing surface area effectively because what it is it reflects the fractality of the network that is what you discover is when you try to when you optimize this system the network um, uh, the network structure that does that is is a fractal one namely it's self-similar i don't know um, that is it just keeps repeating itself over and over again so that if you cut one, you go down the network and you cut a little piece out and you removed it from the network and then you blew it up, it would look just like the old network. So it's, uh, in, you have to blow it up in a nonlinear fashion given by the equations, but there is a operation that, re- that just reproduces the old network. So it just sort of repeats itself nonlinearly, but nevertheless, it's, it's repetitive. And that minimizes uh, the um, energy needed to push through the network. It could also be, it is also, um, if you think of that network as a surface, mm-hmm. uh, I'm sorry, if you think of the capillaries, all the capillaries mm-hmm. you could lay out and they form some weird surface, um, what you're saying is exactly right. It's, the, it's that that surface is effectively maximized with respect to all the changes you can make in the network. So um, the, the, the trick for mammals with a beating heart that is at first a problem is, you know, you got to push it, you got to, you know, your blood comes out of your heart at a very, I've forgotten the numbers now, it's been too long since I've looked at this, but it comes out very fast. You know that if you cut an artery, you don't live very long, you, you know, less than a minute or the blood, rushes out. But if you touch a capillary, break a capillary, you just 
scrape your finger, it just oozes out. And so the system is a part of that fractal nature is extraordinary that it arranges so that the pressure drop from the very high pressure of the heart comes to almost nothing at the bottom so that when the capillary reaches the cell, blood can efficiently diffuse across the cellular membranes to feed the cell. Otherwise, if it was rushing by, if you're just like a straight image of a straw, that's why I'm addressing the question, your image of the, mm. the straw. If you push, it's the same velocity yeah. at the end yeah. as it is at the beginning. As, that's now, a beautiful explanation of why blood comes out so slowly, because clearly it, it makes sense. It, it would be a waste of energy if your absolutely. blood was delivered with, at, at high speed to their yeah. end units, right? They just need to... Right. It's the very last, you know, centimeter or millimeter that they need to travel. So they've kind of like all the all the energy is being used up delivering to, um, you know, things further up the chain. Yeah, I suppose. Absolutely. No, it's, it's a beautiful. I must say, um, independent of anything else, uh, when I um, when 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 I put it all together and had now this um, this model, this theory of the cardiovascular system um, and how it worked. It was quite beautiful. I mean, most, by the way, one of the things, of course, I discovered a lot of this, needless to say, was known. I mean, in one form or another, put it, it was this context that was not known and putting it all together in this form. Much of this had been worked out um, in various parts um, much earlier, even back to, I think, the famous uh, Thomas Young, who was the first to get the speed of blood through, um, you know, through your artery, through your main artery. Um, but uh, anyway, that was the beginning. It turns out trees, of course, and then you have this, this interesting question. Trees don't have um, <laughs> beating hearts. Plants are quite different. So how does it work there? So you have to do that. And in fact, they're not, it's not a bunch of pipes joined together, you know, like we are. We're not, the, we're not like the... The, the, the plumbing system in your house um, where that's that's who we are but plants that plant above you there um, is a bunch of fibers joined together mm. you know like an electrical cable and it sprays out those branches are just the spraying out of the fibers into different branches and so you have to do that you know that that's a whole different calculation you you mentioned that it's three plus one, and uh, you also talked about the the fractal nature of these networks, and and those two points are, are are highly related. And I think this comes across beautifully in your book, uh, Scale, that when you have the way that something scales can add an extra dimension to its behavior as it were. So if you, if you just draw a line on a piece of paper and you double the, the piece of paper, uh, if you've drawn a straight line, well, you've used, you know, that would require twice as much ink. You've drawn a line, which is twice as long, but there are these, you can draw a very special space filling curve on a piece of like paper, which is when you double a piece of paper, you're going to double the ink. And that's kind of obvious because if you space filled the paper <laughs> with, with ink, right. Right. <laughs> it, you've covered the entire area. Um, but that, it takes a little bit of, uh, I guess, mathematical imagination, but that, that trick works all the way up in any dimension. So where we have these, the, these um, networks with our bodies filling three-dimensional space, um, the way that they scale up is, is to the fourth power in a, in a certain sense, or at least the, yeah, this, this kind of critical surface area that they can reach. Yeah. So they behave as if we're in four dimensions. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, what's incredible. The fractal. So, you know, I don't know, um, I don't know if we want to have a little tangential conversation about fractals and the wonders of fractals, but um, we are fractals. I mean, that is, you know, the essential part of us, everything from our, you know, what I've just talked about, our circulatory system to our brains, that we have this kind of self-similar property approximately, obviously. Um, and, um, and, and of course, maybe we will talk about that maybe a little bit later, that, that permeates nature. And this was the great 
discovery of um, Benoit Mandelbaum, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, who then showed us some of the mathematics of fractals. I mean, the curious thing about Mandelbrot, he was a mathematician and he showed no interest in why it was like that. That was most peculiar, actually. I knew Mandelbrot and I used to, in fact, I once had a big argument with him about that. <laughs> but he showed no interest in why would they be like this. It was very strange. Anyway, that's beside the point, maybe. But, um, but, the, it, it, but his discovery was fantastic. I mean, his promotion of it and discovery and um, looking across uh, the, the breadth of science to show examples of it, I think uh, was, was fantastic. Because it is, it is extraordinary that um, we were dominated by Euclidean geometry um, mm-hmm. up for almost 2,000 years, even though, uh, you know, we got out of Euclidean geometry with, uh, you know, differential geometry and Einstein and general relativity and so on. But this other kind of geometry, and, and the point that Mandelbrot, of course, kept making is there aren't right angles and straight lines in nature. <laughs> that's not how nature works. And I think that's, you know, it's very simplistic cartoon kind of statement, but of course, mostly right. Uh, That's true. And and in fact, nature is dominated by these self-similar fractal quantities. And the curious thing about them is, in terms of their dimensionality, as defined by how how they scale, um, they can have uh, dimensions that are not integers. As you said, if you have a line and you double its size, it's twice the length. I mean, by, almost by definition, you think. Um, but these kinds of things, you can double the size. And in fact, uh, all kinds of weird things happen. You know, you get more or you get less sometimes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that the Cox Snowflake, I was looking this up, um, which is this, you know, it looks like a kind of classic snowflake. Um, yeah, that's right. And if you if you double the size of that, you get um, not double, but um, you know twenty six percent extra on top. So its fractal that's fractal right. dimension is is one point two six. Yeah, one point two six is, and that's true of us. I mean, we're not one point two, but uh, our system, you know, that's why you have these the, the kind of Kleiber's law and all these quarter powers. Um, mm. But it's all dominated by four. It's it's that it's it's as if we're in four dimensions because the fractal dimension we have evolved to essentially maximize. Yeah. You know, I mean, we could have had a fractal dimension of 3.7 or 3.2, which would have been still fractal, but we actually maximized it and you can't go beyond one, it turns out. So mm. three plus one that gives you the four. But the mathematics did it. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I the way this happened historically for me, was it's very typical. You know, I did the calculation and it was, you know, it was a complicated mathematical physics calculation, not, uh, you know, a good mathematical physicist would be, anyone could be able to do it, but uh, setting up, solving it, you get the result and you say, wow, that's great. The degrees, fantastic. Now let me try to understand it. You know, where was, you know, what were the essential features through all that hieroglyphics that gave rise to this very simple result. That was, because I think that was particularly the startling thing. Um, Because when I started that calculation, I said, there's no way this is three quarters. I mean, Kleiber fitted it to three quarters, but it's probably 0.738. And that's what I'm going to show that it's point whatever it is. And I showed it was three quarters. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the hell was going on here, that it's such a simple result. Would yeah. come out of a it's not like any of the numbers you tend to get in physics, which is just like, you know, the gravitational constant is some very long, complicated yeah, number. number. Okay, so we <laughs> like, wait a minute, what, what happened here? Yeah. So that's why, but it's very typical in physics. You get a result. Um, especially if it turns out to be, you know, much simpler than you thought, and then you have to go back and think through what were what what was the essential feature? What were the essential features that gave rise to the simplicity that I should have seen a priori? 
So we've got to the three quarter law, and it is yeah. a genuine three quarters. It's not an approximation. Well, that's the theory. Yes, or I mean that's, and the data does. You know, I mean that was the original proposal of of um, Kleiber, and indeed the data certainly you know it, it hovers around that. We've done a lot of analyses, and and of course there's all kinds of controversies about the data and about this and that, which I find somewhat tedious. Um, just one final comment on the fractal um, point. Uh, we were talking earlier about um, Sean McMahon, who I uh, interviewed uh, not so long ago, the astrobiologist. Yes, and yes, you know, his, yes. his whole thing is looking for biosignatures. And it does, yes. I do wonder if, if, you know, if we see some fractal patterns with the right <laughs> dimension on another planet, would, would that constitute a biosignature or at least, or a techno signature? Like, so that's interesting. So um, I was, funnily enough, the Astrobiology Institute, um, the Astro, the, the, when it was set up at NASA, I was one of the people they brought in right at the very, very beginning. This is this has got nothing to do with anything. But in fact, I wrote a, and so they, you know, we were involved in the early discussions as what it should be doing and so forth and so forth. And then they invited proposals. And I wrote, this is, this is, f- quite funny in a way, I wrote a proposal with myself, Murray Gell-Mann, and you know, the famous physicist yeah. at the time, and someone else who's now um, at Harvard, Juan Perez Mercader. And we just assumed, you know, that um, we would get funded and it got rejected. <laughs> so I never became, so I got so pissed off. I, didn't, I so withdrew from the Astrobiology Institute whole thing. Juan is a ma- major member of it now. But anyway, that's got nothing to do with anything other than my own memories of that. Because at that time, I was thinking exactly about this. I mean, that's the relevance of this. In fact, part of that proposal was, could you use any of this? This was just one part of the proposal. Could you use any of this work, this um, scaling work, the fractal-like behavior, its nature, and so on, to... Um, say, yes, there must have been life here, or at least there must have been. Uh, This is evidence that there could have been life here. Now, the real problem with that is obvious that fractals, I mean, just as Sean, point Sean was making, and his seems to be uh, his mission, is to look for non-biological things, abiotic processes that sort of mimic life. And of course, you know, Obvious, the most obvious one here is rivers. I mean, you know, if there's been water and rivers, obviously. But, you know, so the question then is, can you have enough data that you can distinguish the fractal dimension of those from a biological one? And is that meaningful? And so on. So we, you know, I played around with that for a bit. It was a, you know, it's a long shot. But um, certainly if you saw, you know, if you saw things, that had other potential uh, biological features, this would be evidence that um, you should add to that for sure. That if you did see any kind of um, re- either remnant or if the thing was actually still supposedly still alive, that it had this kind of structure. Because I did, oh, so one of the things I did believe in all that was that, um, because it was also part of the astrobiology thing, is that if life exists, exists elsewhere, <laughs> it will have this kind of structure. It will have to be networked and it will try to optimize and it will have evolved. Therefore, it will have quarter powers. So that was sort of the, <laughs> uh, the speculative argument. Uh, maybe this is a good segue on to cities because I think if we, if we were to look up through a telescope and look at a city uh, on, you know, discover an alien city. Yes. It would probably have some very similar properties to um, the cities here on Earth as well. Um, because as you found, cities also behave remarkably similarly in, in many ways to, to, to organisms. So perhaps take us through, well, you know, how did that next leap in your career come about? Yeah, so that was, um, so it was pretty clear once you know one of the things we didn't talk about yet and we may or may not come back to 
is that the, this work, I did say it applied to many things. We took it into many different areas of biology, mm -hmm. understanding growth, understanding um, um, some aspects of cancer, the aging well, perhaps problem. Perhaps we can talk about that first if, yeah. I'm... Well, it might be good to talk about growth, actually, briefly, yeah. because there's a big contrast with cities there. So growth in this works in a very simple way. You, you um, take in food and nutrition, you metabolize, you send the metabolic energy through the networks, the networks goes to the cells and it um, maintains them um, and uh, replaces ones that have died. And in a, in a growing phase, it adds new cells. So, that's, so you can write that down as an equation. It's controlled by the network and so on. But here's the point. The network, the network that is controlling as the system is growing, um, the, that is the supply. The supply is growing in what we call a sublinear fashion. The three quarters is less than one. And one of the things also didn't say that that implies that the energy needed to support a cell is less the bigger you are. It decreases systematically the bigger you are according to this quarter power law. So, um, you know, your cells are working uh, less hard than your dogs, but your horse is working less hard than you. Um, so going back to the growth, that's supplying the cells, but the supply is decreasing as the system gets bigger because it's only decreasing per cell as it's getting bigger because you're adding in a linear fashion. You just keep adding cells. So you're adding the demand is growing faster than the supply because the supply is growing in this sublinear. The demand is growing approximately linear. Linear always beats sublinear. Therefore, you stop. So you can derive the equation. It says, and the solution says you grow quickly at the beginning, and then gradually as the, um, uh, the, the supply um, beats out the uh, demand, as the, the, uh, the demand beats the supply, uh, you stop. That's why you stop and derive. And it's quite beautiful, actually. And you can see that if you rescale accordingly, all organisms can be, and you look through the right lens, all organisms grow at this, following the same curve. And uh, so that's great. And that stability, that, that stable configuration that we end in, that most organisms end in, not all, um, plays obviously a, a hugely important role in the long-term sustainability of the biosphere because you're spending most of your time in a kind of metastable state rather than continually changing. So, um, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm, so we needed to go through that because when we come to cities, you'll see it's not like that. So here's what cities, so cities, so we got into this because um, uh, I'd moved to the Santa Fe Institute uh, because of this work. And uh, the Santa Fe Institute, is this extraordinary place where people from all disciplines, all backgrounds, all stages of their career are all together in one place and all kinds of interesting collaborations, interactions, integrations take place. Um, so I was giving a talk on some of this and uh, in the audience were two visitors um, on sabbatical. One was a well-known anthropologist Sander van der Loo from Paris, and the other was a well-known economist, statistician, David Lane. And they said what I'd already thought about. I brought it up in the talk, actually. I said, you know, it would be really interesting to take this paradigm, as a physicist, it would be really interesting to take this paradigm and apply it to other systems like companies, I said, and possibly cities. I said, you know, because they're networks, they're sort of organismic in some way. It would be interesting. And these guys went sort of bonkers and said, fantastic, that's what we should be doing, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we put together a proposal, which was funded. That one was funded, <laughs> Gen very generously, may I say. And uh, it got me working on, oh, I was going to work on companies because I thought they were, they were much more interesting than cities. I thought cities were boring. 
But it turns out I, in my naivete, I hadn't realized that you couldn't get data on companies without buying it. You know, that is most of it is, well, it's almost all proprietary and uh, uh, various um, companies have assembled data sets, but you had to pay, I think it was $40,000 at the time, I forget some large amount of money that we did not have at our disposal. So I said, okay, look, what we have to do is we have to prove the whole concept of all this by working on this boring problem of cities. Uh, we'll look at cities and then we'll motivate that to get funding so we can buy data and do the real problem of companies. So I put together a different collaboration, a lovely bunch of young people who at that, so as distinct from biology where the scaling laws were known, here they basically were not known. So these guys had to go out, scrape around for the data and discovered to my amazement that uh, indeed, well, I, was well, I wasn't so surprised that they scale. I was surprised at the exponent, the analog to the three quarters. Because the first work that we did, actually the first work was with a uh, colleague at uh, the um, ETH in Zurich, the, uh, it's like the MIT of Switzerland, um, Dirk Helbing, and uh, he and his student. And, and uh, we, we, put together, so he, we put together some data that showed that cities do scale in terms of their um, infrastructure, just like biology. So that was just biology, you know, if you looked at the roads and various things, um, which are very similar to your cardiovascular system, and you plot various things, they scale in the same way when you plot logarithm against logarithm, they're nice straight lines. Um, the only difference being that the slope was 0.85 instead of 0.75. Okay, so we need to understand that. But then the collaboration grew and it expanded into socioeconomic quantities. And there was the big surprise. Uh, and the surprise was that not, well, first of all, it confirmed that things scale. Socioeconomic means things like wages, number of patents, uh, amount of crime, uh, amount of flu, you know, anything that's involving interaction of human beings directly. And all those scaled, but they scaled instead of sublinearly, less than one, superlinearly, bigger than one. So, and, and I'm embarrassed to say I was surprised when I first saw that. In fact, I said something must be wrong. It took me, it, it took me a good 20 minutes to realize that I was completely wrong. And I completely switched and said, my God, of course, I'm, it's, it's, it's exactly right that things that are socioeconomic should scale bigger than one because the bigger you are, what bigger than one means, the bigger you are, the more you have per capita. So the bigger the city, the higher the wages, the more restaurants per capita, um, the more inventions, the more patents per capita, and so on. So I said, it's obvious, that's right, we should have guessed that a priori. And I was really, I, I still kick myself that I hadn't thought of that and written it into the proposal, or written it somewhere, because I can't claim I predicted it, that's for sure. So, um, so the sum total of all this was something that was really um, very satisfying. We looked at data across the globe. So that meant North America, Central America. Oh, no. No, <laughs> Client, sorry, Central America, North America, South America, Europe, Asia, that means China, Japan, let's see where else, I don't know, wherever we could find data. And what we found was the same scaling everywhere, for the same yeah. thing. And that was kind of mind blowing, that was great. Uh, but we discovered that all infrastructure, roughly, that means roads, electrical lines, water lines, scaled with the same exponent, which was about 0.85, um, across the globe, the same way, roughly speaking. Um, 
But all the socioeconomic quantities, whether, as I say, good, bad, or ugly, namely wages, crime, disease, all scaled with the same exponent of about 1.15. So there was, like biology, a kind of universality, um, even though here now it was bifurcated. It was a, mm. you know, it was a dual universality. The infrastructure behaved differently than the uh, socioeconomic. But the fact that it scaled meant that there were universal principles constraining the structure, organization, and growth of cities across mm. the globe. So it was almost as if, it was almost as if, uh, <laughs> you know, in, in, uh, the Industrial Revolution came and people realized cities were going to grow. They were growing. And a big international convention was gathered and all the countries came together and said, how are we going to design cities? And they said, well, we have to do it according to these scaling laws. <laughs> so it was almost, you know, and of course, it's all happened organically. And the question mm. is, how, what, what is the organic principles? What are the organic constraints that have led cities, despite the fact that they're different geographies, different cultures, different histories, that the time and energy that went into the politics and the planning mm. <laughs> individually of each of these places, they all end up sort of lying close to these scaling curves. So these huge constraints obviously are at work. And what are they? Well, um, uh, I would say that our work, and can we derive, of course, a comparable theory that we did as was done in biology to derive the 0.85 and 1.15 and, and so on? Well, the answer is that we've made progress, but it's still a work in progress. We understand, we're, we're very sure of the underlying dynamics, but it's extremely hard to derive a, a really fundamental theory that unambiguously gives these answers. So the idea is the following. The infrastructure is like biology, and it's to do with, again, an optimization. And the idea there is that maybe it's to do with, you know, cities evolved via, you know, they, what, is, what is the point of a city? The whole point of a city is to bring people together in order for them to interact, to facilitate interaction, to increase wealth, to have more ideas, to innovate, to increase quality and standard of life. It's this incredible machine that we have evolved in the last, uh, you know, several thousand years. So, um, uh, but as it evolved um, and people came together, they need to interact. So maybe one of the optimization principles is you try to, uh, the city evolved for people to try to get from point A to point B in the quickest way. You can get to various centers in the quickest way so that was that even though the streets are all going you know especially you know in europe i mean the streets don't it's not a grid but nevertheless when people try to go even now when you try to go to pick up your kid at school that's what you're doing you try to go roughly speaking the quickest way or the, maybe it's the cheapest way but something is that is an optimization that's very analogous to the um, kind of optimization that takes place in biology that we talked about earlier. Now, for the socioeconomic, something different, a little bit different, and that is that you want to optimize, and that's part of that infrastructure thing, the number of interactions, the rate of interactions. You want to optimize number of interactions. And at the same time, and here's the kicker, and this is totally speculative, everybody wants more. Everybody wants more of everything, including, you know, everything from material well-being to even interaction. You know, they want to go to a theater, they want it, and so on. So that's sort of the idea. And, it's, and, and the hard part of this is not just putting those into mathematical terms, which you can do, but is integrating these two networks. You can't talk about them truly separately because you can't have a network of 
interaction. So by the way, the socioeconomic interaction, the flow in the network is really information that's being exchanged. And in the infrastructural network, it's energy and resources. So in the bigger picture, a city is the interface and integration between, on the one hand, its physicality, its energy, its thermodynamics, if you like, with the exchange, with information exchange in social networks, which are tied to that infrastructure. And it's hard to put that into mathematics and it's still ongoing. But we're pretty sure you can show, for example, one of the things that uh, I, I'm, I'm confident of is that um, you notice the superlinear is 1.15, which is 0.15 above linear, and the 0.85 is 0.15 below linear. And that is no accident that the you can show that if you do, if you have these networks integrated, one sort of compensates the other. And it's almost as if the saving that you're making as the city grows, or as you make a bigger city, goes into making the city more productive, more exciting, mm. have more interactions, produces more patents, has more crime, is, you know, is more, more opportunities and so on. I mean, intuitively, that, that feels right. Like, if I can get to the, if it's much, that much easier to get to a restaurant, because it's that much closer, I'm going to go there. And, you know, I'm going to have more interactions. Um, yeah, it's, again, it's, it's worth just pausing for a minute to, to cash out some of the implications of this, just yeah. crunching the numbers that, firstly, as cities get bigger, in a way, they get more efficient, just like organisms. So yeah. you double the size of um, a city, and it's only consuming 75% more resources. Um, and I've heard you say New York is the greenest city. 85. <laughs> Sorry, 85. Yes, 85. The wrong. I was still, still on the biological. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so, you, is, so you're, you're making a 15% saving. Yeah, which is huge. Enormous. I mean, you don't have to rent many doublings till you, you're way ahead. So the curious, the interesting thing about this was that, you know, so much, so during COVID, during a pandemic, um, much better be in a small town because the interactions are much less. And so <laughs> you're much less likely to have catch COVID in a, a small town than you are in a big city. It's sort of, that's obvious in a certain way, but you can put numbers to that, actually. It's much faster in a big city. So that's the point. You're going to get it much faster than you are in a small town. But, you know, if you want a sort of buzzier, sexier life, better be in a big city. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's almost paradoxical that the energy use is, is lower, but it is, the, the pace of life is, is, is faster. Uh, and I do want to comment here as well that it's so intriguing that for, for the longest time, people have talked about cities in this anthropomorphic or maybe biomorphic way. Yes. Um, I was thinking of the, uh, there's that last line of Wordsworth's um, poem on, on, West, on Westminster Bridge, where he says, he's looking at London from Westminster Bridge and he says, um, you know, all that mighty heart is lying still. So that's London at night in um, 18, yeah. the 19th century, uh, no, 1802, 18. Um, so there is this intuition that cities are lively, cities never sleep, you know, all these kind of attributions of uh, animal characteristics to them. And it turns out that in a certain sense, they they do behave something like organisms uh, and and not following exactly the same scaling laws um but nonetheless but, a, but this this superlinearity yeah and that's very different yeah so that's the point of departure yeah where and that comes about so how does that that comes about because the city brings people together and so you have a situation that a talks to B, B talks to C, C talks back to A, and you build on each other. You're continually having positive feedback in those interactions. And, you know, you're creating ideas all the time. Now, 
all those ideas are useless and pointless to anybody else mostly and, and they die very quickly but the whole point is that the spirit of that dynamic has led to the theory of relativity it led to amazon and it led to you know general motors and so on that's that's the process the city does that that's why universities mostly are in big cities yeah have- i think I do find the the Einstein example interesting because I'm always struck that that he was you know a patent clerk in in Bern, which I went to once, and it seemed like a very sleepy city. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's still a city. It's still a city, and you know it's 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 that the ideas around that. Now Einstein, mm. of course, made a you know phase transition a huge enormous leap, but you know it's like it's sort of like. The Newtonian, if I have seen further, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. It's yeah. not like Einstein did it totally in a vacuum. He had no. all that stuff behind him, which came out of urban living. Yeah. You know, I mean, having places, I mean, Oxford and Cambridge have this sort of ivory tower image, but they're actually cities. Yeah. And of themselves, yeah. they are cities. I mean, you bring people together, and that's what, and so city, you know, I think you have to extend even the um, the idea of a city. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. It's, um, it's really the network of people that are connected. That are, it's it's the network of people that are interacting. Mm. It, yeah, it's it's um, yeah, and it's curious. I, I guess even if Einstein wasn't next to the greatest physicists, he had access to all the resources. It made me think of you going to the library to get those books on biology. You know, that's one of the the complicated things that the the city, you know, permits. He discussed with other people, you know, I mean, he, um, including his wife, of course, who didn't get credit, but, uh, so, who was a physicist. But anyway, that's a a detail. But most things are urban, you know, come out of some urban kind of environment. One thing I'm intrigued about is how much of the, additional productivity that can be measured is in some ways firstly possibly an accounting trick in that you know i can tell you a joke now and and if you find it funny you might laugh but you're not going to pay me for it but if i go across the road and i go to this the stand this this famous comedy club and i tell a joke there i might just get paid i mean it's unlikely (laughs) but you know i'm not consuming any more resources or doing anything different really um, but I, you know, something that is economically measurable results there. And I think there's like a, there's a motivating effect of, of living in cities to do that because everything's so, ex- everything is so expensive and perhaps there's also some social competition going on as well. So what I wonder is how much of it is to do with us, you know, producing more ideas through interactions and how much of it is the capture, commercialization, and di- dissemination of ideas and, and, and products based on ideas that is motivated by this kind of boiler room of a city? Well, I think it's both, of course. It is both. But, you know, both of them are require enormous resources. You know, it's not like, I mean, there's this image, you know, when you, when you say thoughts, for example, you first of all, you think, well, thought doesn't cost anything. Of course, it does. I mean, first of all, it costs a little bit of metabolic energy. But, that's, but, but what it does, it costs in your head. You have to be there. You have to be in that house. You have to heat the house. You have transportation. You have entertainment. You have all of Edinburgh there. And that all goes into producing that thought. I mean, that thought costs actually a lot of money. And it's much more expensive, that thought, than a thought that took place 200 years ago actually, because the, inf- the infrastructure needed to keep you here and doing that is much higher. So it's quite complex, all of that. I mean, so you're right. I mean, and that's what makes trying to really have a, you know, a kind of universal theory of how this all works. I mean, after all, what we're getting into here is almost social economics. You know, we're sort of crossing into other boundaries of other fields here, of course, where people try to think of these things. But um, it's it's highly non-trivial, and uh, but the scaling laws, 
to me, are, were a window onto opening up some of this territory to try to understand what that dynamic is and why cities are so important. And, uh, and, and I see them as, uh, almost obviously, it seems to me, the whole future of the planet depends on what happens in cities. Um, that's primarily because, first of all, more than half the globe lives in cities. Um, it's going to be more like 75% before too long. Um, and that's where almost all the ideas are created. You know, the image, the image of the, you know, the guru going on top of the mountain, or even that image of Einstein, who's the nearest we have to it, um, is, you know, is very misleading, I think. The vast majority of ideas and things do occur in an urban kind of environment. And, you know, it wasn't like, um, you know, as, as we've already, you know, I'm, I'm maybe you know, beating a dead horse here. Einstein didn't come out of nowhere. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, when you had century of puzzlement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he had, yeah, he had all that stuff behind him. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, but what I wanted to do was uh, 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 to now really distinguish a, a really important part between cities and organisms. A, as I said, there's this positive feedback. So you have the superlinear, you get bigger you are, the more you have per capita, rather than in biology, the bigger you are, the less you need per capita. Um, so uh, in terms of growth, because when you go to growth and you have the same idea, you know, you take that same um, structure that you have in, in biology, it was you have the metabolic rate, that gets apportioned between maintenance on the one hand and growth on the other. Here you have to invoke something called social metabolic rate. So you could imagine, we've sort of implicitly been talking about it, the sort of energy, including the information, the information translated into energy units, if you like, but the energy that is coming in to say, let's just, just take a city for the moment, coming into the city that's driving everything. And what it's doing on the one hand is maintaining the city as it is, that it's repairing the roads and the buildings and repairing the people with doctors and hospitals and so on. So it's doing all that maintenance work. But then, of course, um, uh, part of it is being apportioned to growing new stuff, growing new buildings, roads, developing different areas, adding new people and so forth. Well, the difference here now is that the driving force the supply is now growing with size as distinct from decreasing with size on a per capita basis. Uh, but the, um, the, the demand is still sort of just adding. So what happens is that the supply completely outruns the demand. So instead of growing and then stopping, you just continually grow not only do you, you grow faster and faster and faster, which is what we see. In fact, you end up growing faster than exponential. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's because that's what happened. I, I, I guess the reason you're growing faster than exponential is that for a city of a given, as you double a city, it, it, it more than doubles the, um, right. the, the sort of creativity, the buzz and so on. Um, and well, that on its own is exponential, but that is then compound. You know, that leads to attracting more people into the city. <laughs> and well, sort of those it's, it's, a, it's a positive. It's a it's a, it's a very fast po positive feedback phenomenon. Yeah, and that's been the history from, especially since the industrial revolution. Of course, um, that has been the history of cities in in almost across the globe, but certainly in all industrialized nations. And, so, um, and that's what we've seen. So actually the theory as it stands is very satisfying because we say, look, we have at the basis, we have social networks where we have this positive feedback, which gives rise to super linear scaling and the super linear scaling then gives rise to super exponential growth. And that's what we see. So it's actually, it's a, it's a nice theory. It's got still, as I say, 
work in progress to really get to the fundamentals, but um, it, it's, a, it's a very complete picture. Um, but it has some weird consequences and some very disturbing consequences. And that is that that, that open-ended growth, which we love and which is the paradigm <laughs> since the uh, Industrial Revolution and the um, discovery of fossil fuels and their exploitation, and capitalism, and entrepreneurship, and all these marvelous things that allow us to do what we're doing now. Um, that, um, so that's the result of all that. But unfortunately, it, the mathematics of it has built into it something that's called a finite time singularity. This word singularity now comes in. And what that means in English is simply that that growth curve going up reaches an infinite number in a finite time. So um, what it's so that, you know, you would have the number of, the, of, of patents or yeah. the number of AIDS cases would become infinite in some finite time. Finite time could be 10 years, 50 mm -hmm. years, 100 years, whatever. We don't, but in some fin not infinite time, and that's obviously crazy. I can't, that obviously doesn't make any sense. But the theory tells you what happens. It says that as you go up and you approach the singularity, um, what happens is that you would then um, sort of stagnate and then mm. collapse. Mm. So it's sort of a sophisticated Malthusian argument. Yeah. That uh, you can't it, it's you can't sustain that kind of growth. Now Malthus got it wrong, and he got it wrong for good for good reasons. I mean, he was attacked, and I think for the right reasons, namely that um, uh, you didn't take into account that people are going to innovate. You know, and it gets you out of that. You know, he said that agricultural agriculture could not keep up with the increase in population because population increases exponentially. And agriculture was linear. He was wrong. Um, but so taking that idea to this theory, and this now is based on, you know, this agrees with data. So it has some, some serious credibility. So as, as this thing goes up and uh, reaches the singularity, what, it, what you realize is that, that what I told you is sort of assuming that, you know, in the big picture, nothing has changed. You know, uh, we're in some major paradigm that uh, like the Industrial Revolution or going way back, the Bronze Age or the Stone Age, you know, something that dominated somehow the way people structured society and the tools they used and so on. Uh, in modern times, that would be, you know, the computer and most recently the internet. You know, that's sort of a, so these big paradigm shifts, these huge innovations, which um, set the tone and the culture of the way that growth takes place. They sort of fix the parameters in a certain sense. So that gives you a hint as to how you get out of this. What it says is you do what we've done. Namely, as you grow this, in this very fast, super exponential way, before you reach the singularity, you better make a major innovation, a major paradigm shift. You better reinvent yourself. You better reset the boundary conditions, start over again, which is effectively what we've done. So we go along these curves, you're approaching a singularity, you discover, I don't know, coal, boom. Then you discover, well, more recently, you invent computers, as I say. Then you invent the internet and so on. And so that's great. That's what we've done. Uh, the hitch to this is that uh, something I haven't talked about, and that is that as the system grows, the pace of life increases. Things get faster. Yeah. Everything gets faster. Uh, um, and... Um, in fact, we've looked at data, and the data supports that in, in agreement with the predictions. Um, so, um, and indeed, one of the things that has to get faster is you have to innovate faster and faster. So an innovation that might have taken 
you know, 50 to 100 years to really develop a thousand years ago, I make this up, uh, now would only take 10 or 15 years. But you have to do a new one. You know, how long has it been? You know, the internet age is what, 20 years old, maybe? I don't know. Um, we're going to have to do another one like it, maybe in 15 years, or we're going to have to do one soon. In fact, you can feel the air, the world, you know. So the pace of life is increasing. We have to do things faster and faster. You have to innovate faster and faster. If you don't, you'll collapse. And we're now approaching such a point again, a singularity, and we have to make some major shift, maybe in the next, you know, 10 to 20 years. And we don't know, of course, we can't predict what that is. We can guess, we can speculate as to what that is. But... The point is that a major people were right in criticizing Malthus and people like the Club of Rome and people like Paul Ehrlich, who all predicted collapse, because none of them seriously took it into account innovation, that things change, that you're going to make a major innovation. This does take that into account. And it says, yes, you can postpone the collapse but you can't stop it because you're just putting off to the next time and you've got to do it again. You've got to make another innovation, but you have to do it quicker than you did the last one and so on and so forth. So if you took a sort of reductio ad absurdum view of this, um, you'd have to end up making a major innovation, you know, sort of every month, which is ridiculous. So, um, so this has built into it. It's the, the collapse of the system. And the question is, how do you get out of that? Yeah. And yeah. I can, I'm happy to speculate, but... My, my goodness, it is a big question. I wanted to comment just on the... Um, I mean, another interesting point of departure between uh, Malthus and your ideas is that they were looking at exponential growth, which is only going to become infinity... At, at infinity. At, at infinity. I mean, exactly. That wasn't the essential problem with their ideas, because sure enough, like w once you have enough consumption, it, it doesn't have to be infinite consumption before it to out it outstrips um, your production. Right. But but as you say, they they ignored the yeah the the innovation that has happened in cycles, and and it seems is happening in quicker and quicker cycles. What comes to my mind is. ChatGPT claiming to be the most quickly adopted tool in history and getting to 100 million users within weeks, which um, I, I have no reason to disbelieve them. In fact, I have more reason to believe them. You know, looking at the history of of, of product adoption, um, but it does seem that at some point, just biological limits are going to call a halt to this. I mean, several things come to mind. In your book, you have this wonderful example of walking pace, which increases um, frustratingly at the, you know, uh, not with the 1.15 exponent, but it gets 10% faster every time right. you double the size of a city, which just one is wonderful. But clearly, you know, if, if, if you... I, I did the maths just earlier, and if you, you know, <laughs> yeah. the whole of new, the whole of the U.S. in um, New York. I'm just trying to look up my calculation. It was uh, what was it? I think I think then that came out to maybe um, 12 miles an hour, which wasn't too bad. It's like jogging, but then if you put the whole of China into one city, <laughs> you, get, you get like 350 miles an hour. And yeah, sure, it's ridiculous. Maybe that'll happen. Maybe we'll sort of turn ourselves into cyborgs, or we'll be going around with roller skates or something. But I, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and you know, one can get even more fundamental and say, look, well, the density of cities increases with 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 size, but presumably, we're not going to create black holes because you know, before we get to that point, <laughs> we're just going to say this is too cramped. I don't like it. But you've raised a really important point, because uh, which I've pondered, um, and that is that um, all this has changed. You know, since since we formed cities, this whole dynamic has been in place. It was very slow until the industrial revolution, and now it's gone bonkers. You know, the, in the last two hundred years, and um, it, it's it's accelerated in a kind of uncontrolled way. Yet we are the same biology. We're the same, not only 
as we were when we were hunter-gatherers and started becoming sedentary 10,000 years ago, but 100,000 years ago or longer, we're the, basically the same with the same brain. And yet we've adapted extraordinarily to this. So that's, first of all, it brings up an interesting question of itself, which I find intriguing. How, in, you know, how, how has our brain been able to adapt so extraordinarily quickly to this fast changing environment that we're in? I mean, that of itself. But then the follow-up question, which is the one that I find most intriguing, is what is the limit to that? You can't have, we can't, I mean, it's, it's the same thing as, you know, um, in the physical world, as the same from the neural world, you know, someone can run the 100 meters in 9.8 seconds. Someone may well run it in 9.7 or 9.6 and even conceivably in nine. But what about five seconds? Or two seconds? Or one second? Well, it's obviously ridiculous. You can't, it wouldn't be a human being, in fact. So there is a limit. We don't know quite where it is. It's, we're probably closer to approaching it for running. But maybe that's true of our neurological capacity. When is it, and already you can feel that. You can feel that with the extraordinary changes that are taking place with the, you know, the new gadgets and new inventions. And every year there's another bloody new iPhone that you have to adapt to or whatever. And I, you know, I'm 83 and I have to adapt to suddenly they, my colleagues decide we've got to use Overleaf. So I have to learn Overleaf. Oh, no, now we're going to do a Google Docs. Now, it sounds trivial, it's something, but, you know, these things are... And, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reasonably smart, but, you know, a lot of people have a struggle with that and they have the equivalent of that um, and they feel uh, disenfranchised almost. And, uh, and so my conclusion is, if you're like that, you vote for Trump because he provides a simple solution. Whereas all this other stuff is so complex. So yeah. that is my... <laughs> that is a theory that, of everything. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so that, no, my point there is I'm being totally sarcastic and silly. But my point there is, are we approaching a time when our brains, our neurology right. simply cannot adapt to the technology we're creating? And it may well be that we've solved the problem with AI and ChatGPT. I don't know. Maybe that, that will do it. Or maybe ChatGPT is the next major AI. Looks like it may well be the next huge paradigm shift, yeah. just like the internet was. May not be. It's too, it's, I mean, despite all the hype, I think it's way too early to tell. It certainly is extraordinary. I gave it a little problem the other day, a very simple problem, and it got it completely wrong, by the way, you know, as, as it does. I mean, inevitably, it's very human, I have to say. Yeah, I, th I think it's extraordinarily good at um, particular fields of programming and quite broad ones. And, and so I, 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 I'm, not, I'm convinced that in certain places it is going to accelerate yeah, production of things oh, and, it, and it will be a absolutely. paradigm shift for for the development of software. And, Absolutely. And no, my, my fear is mostly that it's, um, it, we're going to give so much, I mean, I already hear it, of course, so much over to it, to, to AI and machine learning, um, that um, all kinds of terrible things are going to happen. Um, that, uh, you know, because people are so naive, because most of the people that do this, that make these decisions, have absolutely no idea how this thing works and what it is and what its consequences might be. I mean, it's quite irresponsible, but you know that's the way of the world. Well, we're we're running up against yeah. time. Um, yeah. That's another constraint that that seems very Thank human. We're, we're probably not going to be speaking at a million words per minute in the year twenty one hundred, unless we have interfaced with Chat GPT and, and so forth. But um, uh, but I do, yeah. This throws up so many questions, and I just wonder do you have you pondered what the answers might be it, it seems like we can't carry on speeding up perhaps there'll be a natural biological 
break that's applied. But one has to fear that perhaps that would come too late. Um, it- yes. So I don't know. I, I, you know, obviously it's all spec. I mean, by the way, needless to say, a large part of what I, the last, you know, I don't know, even half hour, 20 minutes is speculative, clearly. It's a different character than the first part of the discussion, but a part that's very extremely interesting and enjoyable and should be, one should participate in, I think. Um, but um, so my, uh, so I got very despondent with some of this, you know, I mean, that is that I couldn't see how we're going to get out of this. And it looks like the system's doomed to collapse eventually. Um, that uh, even, you know, and, and, and that may be wrong now. I didn't, I must admit, I was like many others taken by surprise by how powerful chat GBT was. I mean, I knew a lot about AI because Santa Fe Institute has been involved in AI since its beginnings. I mean, AI has been around for 50 years in various forms. Um, but that was a very serious breakthrough. Um, and as you say, will have profound effects in various parts of um, you know productivity, culture, and so on. But um, so maybe that qualitatively also will change things. I don't know. I sort of think not that we'll still run into the same kinds of problems. Um, Because one of the things that you realize in all this, so it doesn't matter how much science one does, the future of the planet lies with politicians. You know, that is policymakers anyway, people. I mean, they make the decisions, they do it. So, you know, I mean, global warming is a classic example. I mean, only a minority of uh, people really pay serious attention to it. And, uh, you know, we're not really addressing the problems. Um, So it needs that. So that led me to the crazy idea, maybe, that, um, well, first of all, that a paradigm shift, when I when you use the word paradigm shift or major innovation, what immediately comes to mind is a new technology. You know, that's that's the way we've talked about it in the past, especially in more recent years. That's been the way we talk about it. And here we just talked about another one, AI. But um, innovation and paradigm shift, of course, in no way connotes that it has to be technological. Um, it, it could be cultural or political and so forth, who knows? And so um, it led me to this really, (laughs) I'm almost embarrassed to bring it up, but the idea that, you know, what we really need is is what I call an anti-Trump. You know, you need someone with the charisma and apparent attraction of, uh, of of a Donald Trump, namely someone that can change people's, what we presume to be fundamental views in one year. That is, you know, they don't have to believe in truth. They don't need evidence. They can discard science if they wish and so on. We need someone that does exactly the opposite, that sort of promotes a sort of a Jesus Christ or a Martin Luther King or I don't know, mm. Nelson Mandela that somehow instead of tapping in to some of the darker sides that we all have, uh, somehow it, it, um, taps into is the spark that sets off a coherent collective effect of the good in people. Uh, I know this sounds all very naive in 1960s, maybe that's what I'm influenced by, but that, you know, that, that promotes love love thy neighbor, that uh, connotes the idea of collective behavior, that we don't have to continually want everything and have everything Mm. that, you know, that, I mean, it is weird. I mean, roughly speaking, the quality and standard of life probably has monotonically increased, maybe at a slower rate for the last, I don't know how many years, you know, I mean, When you think of the things around you, I mean, I don't know how old you are, but certainly at my age, if I think of life now compared to 20, 40, 60, 80 years ago, the change is absolutely extraordinary. And it has been going on. 
But so why is it that with that happening, people are so unhappy and so disgruntled and want to have authoritarian rule? Why could, how can that be? I mean, you think, I mean, the assumption will be the opposite. We want to reach out to more and be more giving and uh, less wanting. So it needs someone that does that, that can somehow articulate that and uh, somehow re re recenter the, the direction and focus of human beings because it's fairly universal. This. What a wonderful note to end well, on. It's, it's, it's all flaky. You better not show any of that. It's all yeah. a bit. No, it's I, all but, rather flaky. But I think what what is fascinating to me is that you know while you've studied these networks and found what seems to be almost inevitable laws, they're clearly not. They we we have a means of pushing back against these Absolutely. dynamics and deciding the networks that we have around us and how Absolutely. we interact with them. And, you know, it, it does come down to individuals and maybe one person convincing the collective to behave differently. But uh, yeah, one, one can't, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem clear that we can engineer our way out of this solution with a new technology but as you say maybe the paradigm shift is not a technological one yes, but a, a shift of perspective yeah. by the way i'm glad you said some, something i should have said much earlier you know the nature of these laws these are not like newton's laws you know or maxwell's equations or theory of relative relativity or quantum mechanics first of all these laws are stochastic meaning there's lots of variance that's one of the big question how much variance in all these laws, in the biology or the social ones. So um, there's that. And then there's the other that to what extent can you, you know, if you believe everything I've talked about, uh, then the problems we're facing, and it's sort of obvious, and we are rooted in our social networks. And the question is, are they a given? Have they, you know, are they so ingrained in our DNA that we can't change them? Or are they quite cultural and actually with great effort, we can change things? In the, you know, is it, is it like we can stop smoking <laughs> or wear seat belts? Or is it sort of like, you know, this is who we are? I don't know if anyone knows the answer to that. Well, I think anyone can stop smoking if they, you know, if the cigarettes go away and it might be similar to, you know, yes. if we, perhaps that technology does have something to answer for here. The, the way that technology has been developed has been growth focused, but not direction focused, I think. Right. Um, yes. And social media has, has been developed to capture our attention, but not direct our attention where it ought to go, I, I suppose. That's right. And it goes for, and it, and it tends to go towards whatever the, the metric is, least common denominator. Right. Yeah. That's well, it. I hope okay, with, well, we went on a long, yes, I have to go yeah. actually. I think with this podcast, we're sort of doing our bit to, to push back against uh, that. So, uh, <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Anyway, thank you so well, much. Um, th this has been yeah such a, such a tour de force, uh, just like your book. So um, thank you. thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you.